This is Trump on Earth. I'm Reid Frazier. We've heard a lot lately about cutting down on carbon emissions, getting to zero carbon in our economy to stave off the worst effects of climate change. Policy proposals like the Green New Deal and those from Democratic presidential hopefuls and even some Republicans have started to impact the public's thinking about climate change and getting to that zero carbon or almost zero carbon level. But a central question in this issue is, how hard will that be? Can we even get to a future with zero carbon emissions? A few months ago, I co-hosted a panel discussion on this topic with some very knowledgeable experts. The panel was put on by our partner outlet, State Impact Pennsylvania, at Pittsburgh's Energy Innovation Center, and it was co-hosted by my colleague at State Impact, Amy Sisk. In this episode, we're going to re-air that discussion, or at least part of it. And we think there's a lot of good information out there and good discussion about just how hard it's going to be to deal with carbon in our economy. So without further ado, here is that discussion. You're going to hear from these experts. Yvonne Pena, who's an energy analyst, who's worked for the National Renewable Energy Lab in the U.S. and uh, Energy and Gas Regulatory Commission of Columbia, the country of Columbia. Greg Reed is a professor of electric power engineering at the University of Pittsburgh's Swanson School of Engineering. And Paulina Jaramillo is an associate professor of engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University, where she's also co-director of its Green Design Institute. So straight up ahead, here is that discussion. Hope you like it. Okay, Paulina, I'm going to start with you. Um, You've worked on climate issues in many different contexts, uh, including some in the developing world. Why is it important for you to look at the developing world when most of today's emissions are in more developed countries like the U.S., China, and the EU? Amy mentioned a report from the United Nations that was released last year um, with some recommendations for for reaching 1.5 degree Celsius stabilization. And that's a very aggressive target that called for 100% reductions below 2010 levels by 2050. Um, So that's reducing all of our emissions. Um, I've been working in Africa, where we will have 2.5 billion people by 2050. They have very low energy levels, light energy supply levels, and they are going to have to develop to meet the needs of 2.5 billion people. If they follow a path of carbon-intensive development, we can eliminate all of our emissions here. They will make up for what we eliminate. And so if we're talking about eliminated global emissions, completely by 2050, we're also talking about avoiding any new emissions from developing countries. Um, And I think that is some often missed in the discussions um, because we're so worried about eliminating what we already have. But I think we really need to think critically about avoiding what could come. Are there technologies or policies or sort of forms of delivering energy or, or policies that we are working on here that could be exported there or scaled to developing countries? Or is it kind of, they have to kind of come up with their own situation? So the technologies are the same. I mean, wind turbine works the same here as it does somewhere else. Um, I think the biggest challenge in developing countries is the financing, because they are building their energy systems from pretty much scratch in some of these countries. And fossil fuels are still cheaper than many of the other uh, resources, low carbon resources. Um, and it is their position that they, of developing countries that they, are, they have not been responsible for emissions. They need to develop. It is unfair to ask them to incur the cost of avoiding all emissions. But uh, as an engineer, I guess I'm a technology optimist, and I think the the technology is available uh, for some of these things. I think everything around how we deploy them is a little bit more challenging. Um, Greg, you have also worked on these issues around the world, but you've worked on them as well locally here in the Pittsburgh area. So can you talk with us about what recent work you have done here in this region and why it's important to address this global issue on a local scale? 
Certainly. Um, before I talk about the, the regional and local activities, I do want to mention real quick about some of the, the international activities I've been involved with. In, in particular, a new initiative that we've developed with the Danish Energy Agency and our work in Scandinavia. The Scandinavian countries in particular, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, are moving very rapidly to 100% renewables, uh, reducing emissions uh, exponentially, much more so than any other place in the world. And one of the important aspects of having partnerships with them is to be able to share best practices between what they're doing, how can we do that here, and, and vice versa. So we've been able to implement some of that in, in terms of our thinking here in the region. And what we've done here regionally, uh, actually it's, it's pretty expansive, and it's all centered around a program called the District Energy Initiative, uh, a program that we established in partnership with the City of Pittsburgh, uh, the Department of Energy, through not only the uh, offices in Washington, D.C., but here locally at the National Energy Technology Laboratory, the regional foundations and some of our corporate partners, including the utilities, Duquesne Light and People's Gas. So this initiative is really around the concept of a grid of microgrids in and around the city of Pittsburgh, where we can look at building in sustainability, resiliency, reliability, and security into our grid infrastructure, especially at the local distribution level. Um, and why that's really important and, and why cities have such an important role in this is when you look to try to do this either statewide or nationally, as you can see from a national perspective, we don't agree on much and it's very hard to get things done. So what we really want to do is become a global leader here in Pittsburgh of how we transform into the 21st century into a clean and renewable energy environment and reduce emissions at the same time. Um, what makes that important is that cities can take more control than overall states or, again, national entities. I like to say that cities, especially like Pittsburgh, are small enough to get these things done, but big enough to matter. So we can be a catalyst for change, and we can be a focused demonstration for the nation and the rest of the world of how to do this right. And no better place than Pittsburgh. Um, our country was built on the backs of the Industrial Revolution right here. You track the history of energy in our region, you track the history of our country. Um, we've always been at the leadership, whether it's been oil, coal, now natural gas, nuclear technology development, the Westinghouse era of all the electric power grid technologies that still exist very robustly in this region. Pittsburgh is the place to be. We want to continue that leadership role here. It's really our heritage, and now it's our responsibility to provide that leadership. And I think that's why it's so important to do it here and to do it here in Pittsburgh. Thank you. So, Ivan, you've worked in Colombia on renewable energy strategies, and you said that that country already gets something like 70% of its electricity from renewable energy. So can you explain that context? Why is it, I mean, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that number in the United States would be something like 10 or 15%. Um, what, what are some of the advantages uh, that Columbia has in assisting in using that much renewable energy? So yes, Columbia, it's very clean. Actually, on a monthly basis, you can see normal months of about 86% of electricity generation coming from hydropower. Um, but the thing is that it's also a country that it's quite susceptible to water scarcity. So when El Nino event hits, basically there's a huge dry season that creates a lot of stress in the system. And so wind and solar power plants can actually come in place and complement hydro generation. Um, the thing is that right now in the country, there are no wind and solar power plants connected yet. Um, and you would ask why that is the case, right? There is a lot of wind and solar already connected in Argentina, in Chile, in Brazil. And so what we have understood uh, that is happening is that there is a lack of long-term contracts as Pauli was mentioning, there's a lack of financing um, for these type of projects. So without that future certainty, investors decide to go somewhere else, basically. 
Uh, but right now, actually, uh, there's going to be like the first auction uh, for long-term contracts, meaning power agreements for longer than 10 years. And so um, we expect that at least 1,500 megawatts or bid. Um, and I'm very excited to see what that basically entails for the system reliability for the next El Nino. Reliability is, is you know... Yeah, what you don't want to have happen is flip the lights on, light switch on and it is still dark, certainly. <laughs> Um, Paulina, so Pennsylvania's Governor Tom Wolf kicked off this new year with this ambitious goal to reduce Pennsylvania's greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. Now there are others out there who are calling for the country to go to 100% renewable electricity even sooner. So that sort of begs the question, is going completely carbon free feasible and what would a completely decarbonized economy look like? Um, so I think there is a need for a clarification here. There's our energy system and then there's electricity. Electricity is a component of our energy system, but the energy system um, includes the energy for transportation, the energy for industry, um, energy for heating your houses. Um, and in the state of Pennsylvania, about 40% of the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions come from electricity. So decarbonizing, uh, Pennsylvania is not just about decarbonizing the electricity sector. And I, I've, work, I've done work on um, renewable integration into the grid, and there are challenges there, but I'm actually not as worried about um, our ability to do decarbonization in the power sector. I think that's actually the low-hanging fruit um, in terms of decarbonization. I think we have to worry a lot more about transportation. It is not just through our electric vehicles, we have to worry about airplanes and about uh, vessel, like uh, water vessels and about long distance transport through trucks and through trains. And the technologies for decarbonizing those uh, end uses have not received as much attention as for electricity. Same thing with the industrial sector. Um, how do we decarbonize the cement sector? Cement manufacturing accounts for 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'm optimistic about our potential for decarbonizing uh, the electricity sector. You don't um, sound that optimistic, but... Well, I have to, because otherwise I have two kids, uh, <laughs> and I work in this area, so I, you have to remain optimist. Uh, I do think that we've, done, we've moved uh, a lot, uh, very far along on the electricity sector in terms of knowledge, right? We, we're not seeing much action because of political constraints, but we, we, have, we have knowledge there for the power sector. My concern is for the other sectors, the knowledge has not been as prioritized because we all think about electricity first. Right. But what, what, are, uh, what is the best way to decarbonize those hard to decarbonize So we don't sectors. know. I think, I think the challenge is that we don't know. Some of the discussions is electrify everything. And if we electrify everything, we electrify heating, we electrify vehicles, we electrify the, the industrial sector, then we only have to worry about decarbonizing the power sector. Uh, but how do you electrify airplanes? It could also be hydrogen continues to come up in the discussions. Um, I had a professor say once that hydrogen is the fuel of the future and will always be the fuel of the future. Um, and I, the more I work on this, I think we really probably are going to need hydrogen to get to some of these hard to decarbonize sectors. But the hydrogen technology, even through all of the decades of investment, we don't have hydrogen planes yet. So I think those are the technologies that we have to keep an eye out for and invest on. Okay, thanks. Uh, speaking of technology uh, that we don't actually pay much attention to, the grid, Greg, is one of those things that we only really notice when it's not working. Right. But for the purposes of climate change and reducing our carbon emissions, um, the grid is actually a vital piece of infrastructure that needs to be upgraded, essentially, in the United States. What can you tell us about the grid that we have right now and what's wrong with it? The grid is where I spend most of my life, even when everybody else isn't worried about it. So I'm, I'm always worrying about it. 
really, just as a quick definition, you know, the grid is the delivery infrastructure of all of these resources um, to us as end users. It's that critical link, that critical network, transportation network, if you will, highway, if you will, of electrons from where we produce them, no matter how they're produced, to us as end users. One thing I'll say first about the grid in its defense, <laughs> the grid does a great job for us. Um, try to name anything else that you own as a product that is as reliable as the electricity um, that you are dependent upon. Um, I like to call electricity and the role of the grid the lifeblood of modern society. Um, without it, um, as we find out when there are blackouts or disruptions, there's almost nothing we can do. And when we see that in uh, the response to major storm events, you can't even get basic needs and basic first responder activities done until what happens? The power comes back. We've done a tremendous job in this country and in developed nations of providing reliable electricity. So there's tremendous testimony here to what the utility industry and the organizations that support this industry have done um, to make it reliable, make it secure, um, try to improve the resiliency. Where we need to improve in terms of modernization is in technology and infrastructure advancement, something we haven't done really in, in a significant way in decades. The United States, um, very similar to, to most of Europe and other developed nations, built their grid infrastructure up during times of prosperity. Um, for the US, primarily from the 30s and post-World War II into the 40s, all the way until the oil embargo of the early 70s. Our investments in the grid started to decrease over the last quarter of the 20th century. Um, without that investment, we didn't modernize, we didn't expand. What's happening today is that the grid is becoming a legacy infrastructure uh, that is beginning to show signs of vulnerability in terms of its reliability and in terms of how we need it to serve us. Um, one of the things as we talk about resources is the role that the grid plays in resource integration. The grid traditionally was built up largely around metropolitan areas where the resources were very local to the end user. Those were what we're shutting down today, old coal plants and even now um, nuclear plants that, that we're beginning to look at, at not continuing to operate. That's being replaced by different resources, whether it be renewables or natural gas from different locations, many times located further away or in different areas than where we have a concentration of grid infrastructure. So our grid today needs to expand to be able to take the highest penetrations of resources, wind in the plain states as an example, solar in the southwest as an example, and move it to the end use sectors in the big cities, on the east coast, in the midwest, to the west coast. So we need to expand, but we also need to look at the new advancements in grid technology to move more of that energy more efficiently and at lower cost. Today we need to look at intercontinental grids, how we can transport electricity, wind in Scandinavia when it's blowing the hardest and they don't need it over here during a time of day with the time shift to where we need it and maybe our resources aren't as abundant. So there's a whole um, strategy behind what we can do with grid infrastructure, both on national scales as well as international scales. And so a lot of it is modernization, but a lot of it is infrastructure investment and development, which right now has been very difficult because nobody wants transmission lines in their backyard. Can you expand upon that a little bit? And like, how, how would that even be possible for you know, a wind farm over in Scandinavia or somewhere to send its electricity across the ocean to get over to here? Do we have an answer for that? Well, it, it would have to come with the interconnectivity of the technology. Right now, we don't have that. Um, so we, we need to build that infrastructure. Um, it probably wasn't viable a few decades ago. Today, it is. Um, is it expensive? Yes. Um, but we have to look at the costs of you know, what the alternatives are. We'll be back to our discussion on getting to zero carbon in a minute. Speaking of carbon-free, nuclear plants are the nation's largest source of carbon-free electricity, but many can't compete against natural gas and renewables. Now they're asking Pennsylvania for a bailout. State Impact has a new documentary about nuclear's precarious position in the debate over getting to zero carbon. 
Watch Three Mile Island, The New Nuclear Dilemma. Go online to State Impact Pennsylvania to watch. Now, back to our panel with Paulina Jaramillo, Greg Reed, and Yvonne Pena. The topic, Can We Get to Zero Carbon? Yvonne, you have looked at battery storage as a potential solution to solving some problems with energy transmission in Colombia. Um, are there challenges, you know, political or otherwise, to implementing cleaner energy, energy strategies there? Um, and also, do you see any parallels between what's happening with that there to what's happening in the United States? Well, I think uh, the political, I mean, they're not necessarily political challenges challenges in the country itself, but there are other types of challenges for policymakers and decision makers and regulators to actually come up and adapt the existing rules uh, to actually include those new technologies. So I give you an example with battery storage. Uh, in Colombia, basically, in the Caribbean region, there are no hydropower plants. And so there's a lot of congestion because there are very few transmission lines. Uh, battery storage, I mean batteries could be used as storage units and could be used as transmission assets to alleviate that congestion. So the alternative is actually to turn on emergency power plants that are very expensive. So the country would be better off using batteries instead of turning on those very, very expensive power plants. Um, the fact that that doesn't happen, even though the technology is available, is because there's no definition in the set of rules for what a battery can do. So let's say someone asks you what is the cleanest way to get to work, driving or taking the bus. Maybe it's cleaner just to walk, right? But that is not included in the set of options. So uh, as well, like in the set of rules for the electricity system, at least in Colombia, there are certain technologies that are not included yet. Um, I would say the other challenge is actually to build and design new rules that create the most efficient outcome for the system. So as the battery owner, I can provide different services, uh, but the set of rules actually incentivize me to use my battery in the way that is best for the system at the moment that the system needs it the most, right? And so that design is very, very challenging. And I think there is a lot of technology that it's already available and that can create a lot of uh, potential uh, reduction strategies and just, it makes sense economically. It's just that sometimes the rules are not there yet. I'm curious in Colombia what the political will around solving these problems is. If it's like in the U.S. where you have a significant portion of the country basically doesn't want, doesn't feel any urgency towards solving these problems. Uh, I would say that uh, in terms of the electricity itself, everyone is interested in having reliable electricity. So meaning that there's not a blackout. There's a history in the country that... In 1992, actually, there was this year in which everyone was uh, mandated to, I mean, there was a national blackout for, for an hour, every day, every single day, because the Nino, El Nino event was so, so strong. And so there's a lot of po political, actually, will not to let that happen again. And so it's a matter of basically having reliable electricity, but as well, that any uh, tool or any new technology that is considered does not increase the electricity tariff so that end consumers, the industry, does not end up paying more for, for the electricity. I would say in the electricity system itself, since, since it's already very, very clean, there's not much concern with greenhouse gas emissions, with carbon emissions. Uh, although uh, the country is committed to even reducing further uh, the emissions from the electricity sector, um, but, but it's not a major concern just because it's quite clean. Can I mention that real quick, too, in the difference in Scandinavia? I want to keep coming back to that. Very different attitude there. Uh, their approach is very communal. Um, culturally, it's very, very different. Um, not only are they all invested in it, um, from a lifestyle point of view, uh, from a commitment point of view, but literally invested in it. 
in Scandinavia, in Denmark, you and I an individual, as individuals can own a wind turbine, can own a solar installation and reap the benefits from that, socially, economically, and in other ways. We don't have that opportunity here. Our policy and regulatory environment and our markets aren't set up for that. Now, obviously, Denmark and Sweden are very different than the U.S., and, and you know, we're not going to match their cultures, but it's one of the things that we're trying to put into play in terms of best practices of how do we create that same opportunity to incentivize everyone from citizens to corporations uh, to understand the importance of moving in this direction. Yeah, I think what you guys are getting at is um, there are technology problems, but there are also problems of law and politics. Yeah. And our next Absolutely. set of questions is going to try to get in, into those areas. And so I'm going to just put this question out for the whole group um, to answer. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about a Green New Deal uh, among some Democrats and the left in the United States. Um, and basically what it would be would be a sweeping plan to pour public money into quickly moving towards a zero carbon economy. Um, so we're going to put on our crystal ball and say in a couple years, you guys individually will be the Secretary of Energy for President Ocasio-Cortez or whoever it is. I knew you guys would laugh at that. Uh, so let's say you're in charge of energy policy in the U.S. and you have like $2 trillion to spend. I don't know. Is that a lot of money? I don't know. I don't know anymore. Uh, Three trillion gets it done. It'll get something done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what would you spend it on? Um, Paulina, do you want to start? I haven't read all the details um, of the Green New Deal. Uh, I think the concept is interesting. Um, I do, from, from following um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez before she was elected, she was really pushing for 100% renewable electricity. Uh, which is a concern to me because the goal should not be, it should not be technology driven, it should be goal oriented. And so we need everything we can do, we can use to help us get low carbon emissions. Um, and some of those technologies do not qualify as renewables. So I think a Green New Deal that is technology focused, or specific to a, like focused on a specific technology, it may lead to a serious inefficiencies in, in investments. It's also about um, urban form. And so investing in green infrastructure in our cities, right? And the truth is that the US, if you look at the American Society of Civil Engineering Infrastructure Report, we're failing on all levels of infrastructure. So we need to, even if it's not green, we probably need a new deal for infrastructure. So given the challenges with climate change, it seems like adding the green to it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, just to add to that, so I agree with everything. I mean, infrastructure is key to this, and we do have to invest in infrastructure. I'm biased. I would start with the grid. I've already explained that, so I won't repeat it, but we need, we need to do grid modernization. We need to do expansion because of what we talked about before, integrating the highest penetrations of the renewable and, and low-carbon emitting resources uh, into our, our, our system. Uh, so infrastructure investment is where I would start. Uh, but I would also look at how we begin in, in terms of enabling um, a, a zero carbon emission approach. And it sounds contrary, but it actually starts with integrating renewables with lower carbon emitting fuels such as natural gas right now. Natural gas is more of an enabler of renewables um, than not having it at all. And I know that sounds contradictory to a lot of people, but it very, plays a very important role. One of the things around infrastructure development and trying to just throw the switch to a whole set of different resources, as they saw in Germany, um, can result in, in catastrophic consequences, both economically as well as from a reliability point of view. So there are transitions that are going to have to take place. I would invest heavily in those transitions and look at how we can move um, you know, to a low-carbon future integrate renewables, and part of that does need to be because, again, we're trying to take advantage of the assets and the resources that we have locally, regionally, nationally, is to continue to look at, at carbon sequestration um, solutions. They're expensive, but, you know, uh, solar panels and wind turbines were very expensive uh, a while back also. 
Um, but you continue to do development, you continue to invest in R&D, where I put a lot of the money initially, you start to come up with economical solutions. So I think we have to integrate all of that together. Yvonne, you want to take a crack at this? I agree completely. Um, if you look at who is like which sector is the major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, globally is the power sector. Uh, electricity generation accounts for 25% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. And so if you, we really want to you know, make an impact, we should make the power system just cleaner and have a massive adoption of clean technologies. And so any investment that allows a massive adoption and a massive integration, I think it's a great way to go. For me, um, I would look into batteries just because they are so flexible, like they can provide a uh, lot of services. Um, and so I believe that right now there are many, many places in the world that could actually just integrate much more clean power by the using existing batteries. Electrify everything. And there are groups, including the Electric Power Research Institute, that have a whole program on electrification of everything. And if you're getting all your electricity from clean resources, you've, you've, you've gotten there. And that includes the transportation sector with electric vehicles, um, electric truck fleets, so on and so forth, as well as a lot of industrial uses. But I agree with Paulina. That is a very, very, very difficult transition. Paulina, right. I want to I want to just uh, come back to something that you said. Uh, it was a, sort of a little subtle critique that you um, gave about people who want to go 100% renewable right away, why might it be counterproductive for people to insist on everything being 100% renewable by whatever year, 2030, instead of 90% or 80%? Is there, is there, is there a drawback to, to being so, um, I don't know what the word is, maybe pure? As in, I mean, if you're investing on your retirement, you don't put all your money in a single stock, right? And I think that's true for energy. Energy diversity helps, um, gives us options when things fail, allows us to correct for those failures, and just um, create, having a portfolio creates flexibility. Let's be serious about this. Most of the people are um, calling for 100% renewable. They're not calling for 100% renewable. They're calling for 100% wind and solar. Um, I mean, geothermal is not a big uh, resource here. Tidal, we don't really have here either. Hydro, we've expanded as much as we can, and there are serious, hydro expansion can be very challenging. So to me, it just thinking that in 12 years, we're gonna do 100% wind and solar, nothing else. I don't even think we have the technologies that are cost effective level yeah. to do that. I mean, it's an, if we could, I guess. The other thing is we have assets already that are low carbon, that are already built, that are producing, right? So 20% of the U.S. generation is from nuclear power plants that have been producing for years and can continue producing. We have to make investments, but those assets are there. If we retire those assets, it, it, it's already hard to build enough renewables to, to get rid of natural gas or coal if that's the goal. Um, now we're also adding the hurdle of replacing 20% of our low carbon electricity with other low carbon electricity. It's just if you're looking at system optimality and um, resource allocation, because yes, a uh, trillion dollars or two trillion dollars is a lot of money, but if you work with grants from academia, you realize that a million dollars goes up fast. Um, like we need to be efficient with the use of those of, of those funds, and so we we need to have a portfolio of options. And it's true, new nuclear currently is not cost competitive. No optimization model ever chooses new nuclear, uh, but existing nuclear is still there. And investing on on those technologies, um, even though they're still expensive, like you said, they were expensive. I mean, solar PV three years ago was still more expensive. Um, so, and then, like, so, for example, focusing on renewables um, eliminates, takes CCS, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, out of the equation. If you look at the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees Celsius, every scenario that reaches stabilization target includes carbon capture and sequestration. Yeah. Um, every scenario. I mean, some, like, it's scary. Um, 
because it's not just carbon capture and sequestration at coal and natural gas plants, it's carbon capture and sequestration of a biomass plant, it's carbon cap capture and sequestration from the air. And if you focus on wind and solar, you're, getting, you're, you're not going to be investing in those technologies that we will need. Right, there's talk that we need to go negative, negative emissions right. to, to deal with this. I have one more quick question that I want to pose to each of you. What is one piece of technology or one policy idea that you are really excited about? Um, you know, it could be offshore wind, you know, in the Great Lakes. It could be a carbon tax. It could be anything. Um, Paulina, start with you. So I wouldn't say excited, but I would say scared of not pursuing it. Um, <laughs> That's it's, fair. That's one form um, of excitement. <laughs> it's carbon capture and sequestration. I, like, there are a lot of unknowns. Bio, going through bioenergy is scary for many reasons, but I think it's scarier to not. What I'm most excited about and what I'm most optimistic about is our human capital. And I say that because I get to spend a good part of my day, um, sometimes not enough of it, with wonderful students, um, uh, the youth that's going to uh, come in and help us address these challenges. So I'm, I'm most optimistic and excited about the human innovation that's coming from the students that are in my classroom and in my lab. One of them is here. Uh, Jenna, stand up and say hi, because there aren't enough students in, in this room right now. So Hello. Jenna, um, thanks for coming. <laughs> and, and, and there's a few other students that are in here whose names I don't know. Um, you're not in my classes, and you might not even be Pitt students, and, and even some high school kids, it looks like, and younger. And that's wonderful. I'm so glad you're here, uh, because that's what I get most excited about. If there's anything we can, we can be optimistic about, it's, it's all of you and your role in this in the future. So keep studying hard, keep working hard, um, be excited and passionate about it, because we're all up here trying to come up with ideas, and, and plans and designs uh, to create a better future for you, but it's, it's also your future. And uh, we want you to be able to, to, to take advantage of that. Right, and Yvonne, what's a piece of technology or policy idea that gets you excited? So, uh, well, first, I, I totally agree with carbon capture and sequestration, what you just said, Paulina. Um, definitely, we need to get negative uh, if there's going to be like a larger impact. Uh, but I would say I'm very excited about batteries, uh, second generation batteries. 80% uh, of uh, batteries in the power sector in the US are lithium ion batteries. And I'm excited about the prospects for lithium metal batteries. They seem to be more, they, they promise to have more energy density and prices seem to to be also uh, going down and be able to hit the $100 per kilowatt hour, uh, like this magic number that uh, Tesla has for, for comparing combustion engines with electric vehicles. Apparently, like $100 per kilowatt hour would make electric vehicles uh, competitive compared to combustion engines. And so lithium metal batteries seems uh, also to go in the direction of becoming uh, less and less expensive. So I'm, I'm just excited about seeing how this unfolds. All right. Well, I think that we are going to wrap up this discussion here. It's about all that we have time for. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the Energy Innovation Center for hosting us here tonight. And let's give a big round of applause, of course, to our panelists. You just heard from Ivan Pena, Greg Reed, and Paulina Jaramillo, who spoke at State Impact Pennsylvania's event, Can We Get to a Zero Carbon Future, held on January 29th at the Energy Innovation Center in Pittsburgh. It was co-hosted by me and Amy Sisk. State Impact Pennsylvania is a public radio collaboration between WHYY, WITF, WESA, and the Allegheny Front, which covers Pennsylvania's energy economy. Thanks for listening to Trump on Earth. I'm Reed Frazier. If you like our show, please consider supporting us through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Trump on Earth. You can find all of our episodes online at trumponearth.org or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is supported in part by the Robert F. Schumann Foundation.
Our producer and digital editor is Andy Kubis. Kathy Nauer is the executive producer. I'm Reed Frazier. See you next time.